So my deepest apologies uh, for that. We're still doing the same paper. It's on mTOR signaling. Um, and uh, I'm brought to you by Lifespan.io. So um, welcome, welcome. Um, before we kick it off, um, I've been reminded to remind everybody else that we have a conference coming up at the end of summer, August, um, particularly August 19th through the 22nd. So a three-day online conference. Hopefully, hopefully this will be the last online conference and we will have a live conference, which is the way we used to do it for the first several conferences until uh, the world just basically shifted off its poles momentarily and hopefully everything will get back. Um, today is also the last day um, to uh, to get your tickets um, other uh, that uh, get your tickets cheaper than 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 they normally will be, which they'll go up by 50 bucks, I think tomorrow. So starting you got until 11 p.m. Eastern time um, here in the U.S., Eastern time, 11 p.m. to uh, get those tickets. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll, uh, you know, 50 bucks will, will be added on to the cost, um, which will still be a value. Um, but, you know, hey, get an even better value by, by getting the tickets now. So, um so um, that's my that's my spiel. Um, if you've been to our conferences before, you know that we've got some great um, speakers. Um, uh, it's uh, fantastic talks, a lot of cutting edge stuff that's presented um, that later comes out in publication. So we have quite a few speakers that present their data, um, and then and then uh, you, you get a heads up preview before you know a lot of it gets published. So um, a lot of a lot of great stuff. Um, okay, so. Um, that is, uh, I think that's the only announcements I need to make outside of the journal club. Um, so welcome everybody. So I'm going to kind of quickly share the screen here. Um, there's a lot of articles coming out. You know, there's always things come out in spurts. I mean, aging community is always, there's always articles coming out, but sometimes you get a boatload. Um, so it's hard to pick good ones. Um, and, and there was a couple that, that uh, we were sifting through. Um, so if this is not your favorite one at the time, don't worry, we'll probably get to it later. Um, this is, like I said, uh, article on mTOR signaling. So I'm going to share. Uh, let me move my face out of the way. Um, this is so I can see. So um, let me know, Fatima uh, or anybody else that is can't see this or it's all cockeyed or something. I could um, move it around. But okay. So this is the title, a Torque 1 Histone Axis Regulates Chromatin Organization and Non-Canonical Induction of Autophagy to Ameliorate Aging um, by uh, Lou et al., um, number of labs around the world, Max Planck Institute, also University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where Richard Miller is there. Um, and this is done in Drosophila. So this is a Drosophila study. Um, We'll try to get through as many figures as possible. There's eight figures, I believe. Um, and then they then they um, recapitulate a lot of this work in mice. <clears throat> so they, they do do a uh, mouse uh, mouse experiments at the end to show that this signaling pathway, um, where mTOR signaling, uh, which is basically a target of rapamycin. So we've we've been you know, doing papers uh, before on on TOR, which is this complex um, that basically is a you know um, it's a major signaling complex, and um, it's sort of a nexus for a lot, of, a lot of signals, and it regulates cell cycle, it regulates stress responses, regulates a lot of things, a lot of things, insulin sensing and signaling. Um, so here, what they want to do is they are connecting um, the core pathway with um, chromatin, uh, basically um, the regulation of chromatin organization, specifically um, specifically the upregulation of histones in a uh, translational manner, mm -hmm. not a transcriptional manner. Um, so I'm gonna actually scroll down to the end because um, you know, as it is, as it is typical in scientific publications, you start at the beginning and you end at the ending, and usually the ending summarizes things, and then you know, sometimes I like to get the summary first before I go through everything. So um, so, you know, it's like, all right, if I'm going to have a pet peeve with this paper, it would be, whoops, it would be, it would be that I would love to see this figure a little further up, <laughs> which is a summary of 
basically was, you know, a model, sort of a, a, a cartoon model, right? So here it is. So here is your, here is your rapamycin, um, little cartoon pill up here. Um, so this is a, a drug that was found in a soil bacterium on an island, right? Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and, um, and it's, it's FDA approved for a number of things. I believe in very high doses, it's, it's an immunosuppressant. So they give this stuff to people who have you know, gotten organ transplants. Um, but lower dosages, it has you know, positive effects on lifespan. It uh, inhibits um, this complex here. So this, is, uh, this uh, figure here is actually uh, the work that's being recapitulated in mice. So it's mammalian TOR, so mTORC1. Um, so rapamycin inhibits this complex, um, and this complex itself inhibits a number of things uh, downstream. So inhibiting this inhibitor does good things, right? So basically, and things that they show that it inhibits uh, in the paper is, well, um, the TOR signaling pathway inhibits uh, this protein complex here which is also another new complex. This is uh, eukaryotic initiation factor three, um, and there's a bunch of initiation factors. And this is, uh, this is basically required for the initiation of translation, right? So if you recall your central dogma, you have you know, your DNA, and then you have transcription, you have RNA transcripts made, and those transcripts need to be converted or translated into proteins, um, particularly in this case, histone proteins. And histones are proteins that are used to package DNA, right? So, and the way DNA is packaged affects its stability. It affects its, you know, ability to be, you know, transcribed from certain regions. So a lot of things. Um, so this EIF3 complex um, regulates, uh, uh, regulates the, exp the translation of a lot of proteins, but part primarily histones. And this is what they'll show um, in the paper, um, both in, um, well, primarily in Drosophila, but I think they want to show this here in, 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 in mice. Um, it also, this complex inhibits uh, this other uh, complex. So complexes inhibit the other complexes, ATG1, ULK, ULK1 complex, um, which basically promotes autophagy, right? Um, and the histones themselves here um, also affect particular histones that um, go to certain regions. They affect, that are affected themselves by this transcriptional, by this translational complex, EIF3, affect the expression of this protein here, <laughs> BCHS, otherwise known as blue cheese, believe it or not. Um, this is Drosophila genetics, so expect weirdness. Um, I don't know why it's called blue cheese. Um, it could be any of number of reasons. Maybe the flies don't can't smell blue cheese anymore. Um, a lot of this stuff is basically, um, basically quirkily named after some weird phenotype that the fly possesses, like frizzled or, or whatever. Um, so ECHS, blue cheese it is. And <laughs> what blue cheese does, it's basically a cargo adapter protein that basically takes misfolded proteins and packs them into vesicles to be basically degraded, right? So all of this stuff. So basically everything downstream is pushing things into autophagy. Um, and uh, furthermore, this auto Autophagal, I guess, response um, is it also promotes, and they show that. So it, this is happening primarily um, in intestinal epithelial cells, and this is um, this is also has an effect. Um, I don't know the exact connection there, but there is a protein that's also upregulated as a result of all of this that promotes barrier function. Which uh, barriers are these? Basically, proteins that essentially stitch cells together in the intestinal epithelia to prevent leakage, right? So you don't want a leaky colon, you don't want a leaky gut, because then you have things on this side, which is the lumen of the gut, um, getting past basically the between cells and, you know, um, toxins get basically released. So um, a healthy gut is not a leaky gut, right? So basically you have better barrier function as well. And all of this basically translates to better intestinal health and longevity. So a lot of this stuff is happening in um, these intestinal epithelial cells, um, but not in other types of cells. And I'm not sure if they looked at it so thoroughly in mice, but they did certainly in Drosophila. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. So that's my, that's my summary of, of, of um, sort of the findings. So when I say these terms, 
built sort of you have sort of a roadmap where to where to put them. Um, so let's see. Where, let's go back to share screen. Um, okay, so let's scroll. Let's go to the beginning. So that was the end. That was the very end. So. So let us let us scroll through uh, the steps. So they do a number of they do a number of experiments, and I sort of went kind of uh, went all the way to the punchline. So now I'm kind of sort of build the paper up and demonstrate sort of the evidence that they present for uh, for that model that's down there. Um, so they look at a number of Drosophila. They look at um, I believe they look at uh, female flies here. I think because the effects of rapamycin are more pronounced in female flies. I'm not 100% certain but that's the case. But they look at wild type female flies um, in this WDAH background. Um, so young. Uh, they look. They do experiments in young, 30-day uh, and 50-day old old mice. Uh, there's a lot of supplemental data here that I'm not going to go through, um, but and some of it's not shown here. So they're looking at, um, so they show, they recapitulate, they show that rapamycin obviously extends lifespan to a degree in mice, so you have greater survival. Um, and they look at protein expression levels of histone proteins. Um, and the reason why, you know, they're looking at these histone proteins, H3 and H4, there's a number of different um, histone proteins is because a lot of these, you know, they're basing this on previous work that's shown that these proteins are upregulated in, you know, in longevity pathways and other species like yeast, for example. So uh, a lot of the reasons they picked, you know, um, these particular things is because they've been shown to work in other, other species. So um, the bottom line is that uh, when they looked at brain, they looked at muscle, they looked at fat, um, they did not see uh, they did not see an upregulation um, in these histone proteins, but they did in intestinal cells. Um, and this was in so this is basically a uh, quantification of protein expression. So you have a blot on the left side. Um, so these are um, flies of different ages, um, and these levels actually do go up um, considerably. Um, Maybe as a you know as a as a uh, sort of a, as a preventative measure in flies that you know that age, but this is this is greatly increased when you add rapamycin. So rapamycin causes these levels to increase even more. So the histone three and histone le four levels um, increase considerably. So expression of core histones in fly intestine increases with age and in response to rapamycin treatment. So pretty straightforward finding. In my in my opinion, that's one of the more interesting and surprising results in their paper, their yeah. figure 1C, or just their baseline. Um, when I saw that the first time, it's like, wait, why on earth are you going to have age-associated increase in histone expression? Mm -hmm. um, like, I only know of two circumstances where a cell is going to increase histone translation. If you've, if you've got like, if your cell's dividing a lot, well, more DNA, more histones. And then if you've got like DNA damage, like mm. um, generally awesome. if you have double stranded breaks or stuff, um, one thing is that you generally replace histones or at least like your histone H3. So I'm guessing older cells aren't dividing more, but like that baseline makes you wonder, huh, is there more DNA repair going on at baseline in older cells? Um, I have no idea, but it would be consistent. Yeah. Um, I would that makes sense to me. I mean, that's, I was, uh, you know, when you, when you, when you mentioned the two cases, and then you mentioned the DNA damage, I was like, well, you know, that's, that could be, um, I'm going to go out on the limb here and kind of throw out sort of a, a blanket hunch guess that might not just apply to histone H3 and H4 and, and why they rise because, because of, you know, this association with DNA damage and DNA damage repair. But I think you probably will see, um, and I'm, I, I don't have the references here to pull out, and I'm sure they've shown this in other you know, systems, but I would, I would think that across the board, if that's the case, and I would think that across the board, all repair systems would start to start getting upregulated because of, uh, due to age, because of all sorts of damage that's accruing. Mm -hmm. And the system is trying to do damage control um, 
but it's not effective because the systems themselves that are doing damage control are being affected as well, right? So it's sort of a, you know, sort it's sort of like uh, the the little Dutch boy trying to plug up holes. Right? I was kind of wondering the same thing. Like, is it, is it, would that be a sign of having of trying to do damage control and not getting stuck, like not being able yeah. to uh, finish the job? Yeah, um, I, I, that's you know, like that's that's my qualitative hunch. I, I and I would think I I would if I would like throw out a like a real blanket hypothesis, I would say that that this is not specific to histone H three and H four. I, I would be surprised. You know that you know I would be more I would be surprised if this was just something specific to histone H three H four, right? Rather than across the board effect like this. If they looked at other damage response pathways, they would see the same thing, kind of same trend. Um, but not as much as if you put something in there that would boost longevity, like rapamycin, or something that that hit an orthologous pathway. You know, for something that you know because mTOR probably isn't going to affect all the damage pathway, but something else that's affected by a longevity mediating treatment or genetic manipulation, right? I would expect that that, that would, you know, further boost it as well, obviously. Um, but mm -hmm. we'd probably see a, a, a slight increase in those as well. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, my, my only other remark at this like beginning of the paper, so they, they, they're focusing on enterocytes. And my first question was, well, why? <laughs> um, and I guess one answer is, well, enterocytes are where they see their effect, <laughs> but, yeah. um, one interesting thing about enterocytes is, as far as I know, they're just about one of the most replica replicative tissues in the body. Like, mm. you've probably got more mitosis per week, per year, than any other cell type. Like, if you get radiation sickness, one of the things is that your intestinal lining could slough off. Well, it's right. really replicative. If you get, like, Lynch syndrome, which is right. damages like mitosis-associated DNA repair, the symptoms are colon cancer. So... I don't know like what the significance of that is, but it makes, it's kind of interesting to me that when they are looking at these rapamycin effects, this is the tissue where they focus on, or there's where like enterocytes are already different in the amount of replication they do. Um, so yeah, I kind of was looking at this paper through that lens. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's again, a good point that you raise and it, again, Going back to like the histone uh, H3 and H4 comparison and, 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 and thinking outwards from that, it might not be specific to enterocytes, it just might be really, really actively mitotic tissue, right? And uh, so if they looked at cells and hair follicles or cells that are in maybe hepatocytes, other act very active mitotic tissue, well, liver isn't really mitotically active too much unless it's damaged, but, but other, other tissue that has a high turnover, um, that I would expect that you know that might be this this might be a pathway that that is predominant in in mitotically active tissue right because if we we go into back to uh, whoops sorry I lost this where's my zoom. Some reason my dashboard can't. Uh, let's one second here. All right, here we go. Uh, Share your screen. Um, yeah. So going back to right. So they look at um, they look at muscle and brain, which is not really actively mitotic. Fat. Um, I don't know what the turnover is for adipocytes. Um, probably. Like you said, well, definitely not as much as intestinal, like the, the enterocytes and the intestinal lumen, right? But, but it'd be interesting if they looked at another high turnover cell. Yeah, you might think like other epithelium or blood cells. Yeah. You said liver. L liver might be a good choice. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I don't. I don't recall that being mentioned. Um, so so, but uh, but that would you know that would further make this bolster the case, right? For a kind of a more kind of holistic. Uh, uh, wider ranging hypothesis, right? That this pathway is predominantly working, you know, in not just something quirky intestinal epithelial cells, right? That are that are differentiated, not not even the intestinal stem cells, because they look at four different types of intestinal cells. But it's not just in those enterocytes, but it's in 
very actively mitotic, you know, mitotic tissue. Um, and it's not just also limited to histone H3, H4 that these steady cycle goes up, but you have know, similar effects on, on other pathways that regulate. Um, anyway, um, those are some ideas that we've tossed out to people. So there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so um, so they do a num number of things that they don't they don't have this, this isn't supplemental, but they show that the rapamycin treatment did not affect cell composition or enterocyte cell polyploidization in the intestine. Um, and this is basically showing that, that it's, um, uh, that you're getting more, um, that's, you, know, you, you basically have literally more histones, H3 and H4 in the cells. It's not because they're polyploid or you have more cells building up. Um, so this is in their supplemental. Um, so I'm skipping to figure two here, where they link this to um, protein regulation through these um, uh, eukaryotic initiation factor. Um, so that um, it's these this histone levels are due to not uh, not to transcription, but through um, actually to regulation of translation. Um, so figure two is expression of core histones in the fly intestine in response to rapamycin treatment and inhibition of, oops, inhibition of translation or translation factors, eukaryotic initiation factor, factor EIF3 and EIF4. Um, and I believe that's like the non-canonical factor. And there's another factor that they look at later, EIF or E, which does not have an effect. Um, so this is, these factors are um, mediated by TOR signaling. So what they do here is, um, what are they doing? So they had used, so in general, they use cyclohexamide. Uh, so H3 and H4, so you have a blot here on the left showing protein levels. Um, so you have a mycin treatment, um, which is shown before to increase levels of fist of H3 and H4. Um, and cyclohexamide, um, which uh, does not, uh, so what does it do? So actually for H3 and H4, cyclohexamide is having a negligible effect on translation. Now I know it hits, I um, can't recall exactly where cyclohexamide hits. I know it affects, I think, TR placement in, um, and I'm not sure if cyclohexamide, if, Elongation initiation factor 3D and 3G bypass um, that effect from cyclohexamide. But um, they seem to be showing that with rapamycin, you obviously get the increase. So that's your red boxes here with H3 um, histones per DNA. So you have much more um, histones being incorporated in H4. Um, and this is abrogated by cyclohexamide. Um, so you doesn't seem to, the levels they're using here don't seem to be knocking it down. So they're using just enough levels here to aggregate the effects of the rapamycin, but not enough to block overall translation, um, if that makes sense. So this is sort of a general translation inhibitor. Um, and you do get, you do get this blockage um, using cyclohexamide. Um, they do a, use another system. This is a system where I believe it's, um, they have a genetic locus 5966GS that's um, affected by, whoops, we have questions here in the chat. Um, oh, well, computer, okay. <laughs> welcome, welcome. All right, so, um, so 5966GS, so uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Sometimes I am, usually I am. Um, but I believe it's a, it's, so they express RNAi from this location um, using an RU486 based um, expression system. So I think this is a, this is an integrated locus so they can basically switch on things and they use this system. So it might get a little confusing. So I'll just mention this right now. They use this throughout the paper and sometimes they express RNAi that would knock down um, EIF3D, so this component of elong eukaryotic initiation factor 3D. And sometimes they use it to overexpress or switch on the expression of histone H3 and H4, which you'll do later. 
Um, so obviously if you get higher levels of H3 and H4, that's good. But here, if you knock down EIF3D1 by expressing an RNA high, which is an interfering RNA high, um, then you will then knock down H3D. That's what they show here. So actually that's a finding. Right? So, um, so basically the effect from rapamycin can be blocked using um, RNAi that's switched on using an RU486, which is basically, um, well, it's, it's a drug, uh, it's a drug used in, you know, terminate early pregnancies, but it's also basically a, a hormone and, um, uh, and it's used to bind to a, a protein that, that can be used to regulate genes and switch them on. So this is, this is used in, you know, in this system. So um, they feed this to the flies and, by knocking down EIF3D, you basically abrogate the uh, expression levels, the protein levels of H3 and H4 DNA. Um, so the RU486, which is really the expression of RNAi to knock down EIF3D, which is that elongation factor through uh, this non-canonical that they call elongation factor works to block it. Part of this complex EI. EIF3G also um, works, I believe, here. So you have a knockdown effect. So this knockdown effect is in this green here, um, down to basal levels of, um, and this effect, I believe, is not found using this canonical um, elongation factor, this uh, eukaryotic IF4E. Um, so they try to knock that one down. Um, and I believe that is that is not working. So it's it's through this. So they want to pinpoint it through this particular class of elongation factors um, that are responsible for translation, and uh, these are the ones that uh, uh, these are the ones that are playing the role um, in the rapamycin effect. So I'm just going to quickly scroll here before I stop sharing and take a little pause here. So are there any questions on that? Okay. I kind of thought that was a cool figure too. Like my understanding is rapamycin like canonically hits elongation factor four, like a couple of different subunits. So hmm. like when rapamycin does its whole like throttling of protein translation, it's allegedly by hitting um, yeah if four. And um, I. I had never heard of like the cap independent translation the DIF3 is supposed to mediate. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird to me to think that like what's rapamycin do? Okay, well, it, in theory, it knocks, it decreases the most protein translation, except there's a host of like weird things that EIF3 um, translates that get upregulated anyway. Um, so for me, that's just not how I thought something like rapamycin would work. And I thought these, this figure was kind of convincing in showing that. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I, I also like even just even more kind of broader scale, it's interesting. Like, these dosages all matter, right? Because when people traditionally for, for a long time have thought about rapamycin, it's to inhibit um, the immune response, right? Because it's an immunosuppressant. But those are like huge quantity, like large, I don't know what the dosages are. Those are large dosages that people take and it, it affects the mitosis. So it basically inhibits you know, so basically inhibits mTOR signaling, which does a lot of things, but it'll also in, like at a high enough dose, it'll inhibit cells that are primarily T cells and inhibit their, their mitosis and that will affect um, obviously, you know, um, immune response. But lower levels tend to, Im they had some several papers that they cited here have improved the vaccine response to elderly patients. So it has a beneficial effect on the immune system, right? So a more stimulatory effect at, at lower levels of rapamycin, right? So, so you, dosages matter, right? So you can't just say that, well, you know, like, like rapamycin might be dangerous for old people because it, uh, it, it will suppress the immune system and their immune system is already suppressed. And you get this paradoxical effect here. It's like, wait a minute, if you lower the dosage and you get a better response, right? So, so dosage matters, right? So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. So, you know, when, when I think you do see a, a paradoxical effect like that, that um, um, but things can go, things go two different directions, right? Depending on, depending on the dose. Um, 
And that's always been a problem, I think, in, in, in molecular biology that people have realized years and years ago, right? Where you do very crude studies where you overexpress something, right? And you're like, you know, it's like, you know, and you get one effect and you're like, well, that must mean that the protein does this because we threw in tons of it, you know, and the effect went this way. And then you're like, well, you know, the systems might be compensating for that by suppressing something, you know, because of your regulation. So it's, you know, it, you have to, you have to be careful with, with just cranking things up because you have, you have, um, you have feedback systems that respond to that and will, will give you a paradoxical effect. That's just my two cents on that. Um, okay, so before I jump in, we had somebody in the chat here. Um, yeah, Steve thinks the paper is interesting mainly because it isn't just the mTOR pathway slowing metabolism, right? It's affecting DNA um, and it's affecting how DNA is, 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 is you know, put together through histones and organized and, uh, and exactly it's connecting mTOR signaling to, through the, to the other, um, to the other um, drivers of aging, right? So, so genomic instability, epigenetic alteration potentially, right? Because you have different arrays of histones being, so yeah. So I think as, 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 as all of these papers come in, these are really good core papers because they'll, they, we can get now a much more integrated linking of all of these, all of these regulatory pathways, um, you know, to get perhaps the grand unified theory of aging, right? Um, I don't like to call it that. I would call it the grand unified theory of longevity pathways, right? So that's my pet peeve. Um, I know I'm being a bit maybe pedagogical or academic here, but I don't think so. I think longevity pathways are, this is my rant, longevity pathways is what evolution works on, not aging. Longevity pathways evolved to, um, to basically suppress aging, right? So, um, so if I say something controversial, it'll be something to the effect that aging is not genetically determined. Longevity pathways are, right? So that's why, that's my, and, um, and other scientists, I think, will, will you know, will, uh, a lot of scientists agree with me, you know, some, some don't, but, you know, that's, um, that's how I, that's how I view it. Um, and I, and, and I think that's kind of a good thing to keep in mind. It, 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 it makes a lot of sense. One prediction from that, and I think a paper that was recently published, I think it was by, um, I want to say Brian Kennedy, but it could have been um, his other, uh, uh, the other, I can't remember. Um, but uh, one prediction would be that longevity pathways themselves, things that regulate um, DNA repair, things that basically promote DNA stability, um, are probably going to be, if that's the case, are probably going to be the most evolutionarily ancient and conserved pathways um, throughout all organisms. Um, that is, I think that that's a that's a prediction that I would make. That that uh, that pathways that that do prevent entropy, which is aging in cells, are probably going to be the most evolutionarily conserved pathways. Um, bacteria, eukaryotes, you name it. That's so. I'll just. I'll just throw that out there as well. So those are my, you know, I don't think those are controversial statements, but maybe some people do. Anyway, back to the paper. Um, that's that's how that's that's my guiding principle when I when I look at all these papers and try to try to organize them in my brain rather than having a whole bunch of data that's helter skelter all over the place. Um, okay, so back to the paper. Um, less lecturing. Uh, let's, where's the, okay. Okay, so we are now in figure three. All right, so figure three. Um, increased histone expression in response to rapamycin treatment causes chromatin rearrangement and heterochromatin expansion across the nucleus in intestinal enterocytes. So those were those mitotically active cells um, that Michael mentioned that are um, divide a lot. They're in your gut. Your gut takes a lot of, you know, a lot of turnover there. Um, and, you know, they're looking a little bit more downstream. So, okay, so you get more histone H3 and H4. What does that mean? Um, it means that, uh, you know, the chromatin gets reorganized differently. And this is what they're looking at here. Um, so this is, I think, I think it's DAPI. Yeah, DAPI staining. And uh, basically, with and without rapamycin. Um, also, they show that it's not just rapamycin, but 
uh, overexpression. So here on the right, so this is A and B on the right, the 5966GS. Um, I don't know why they have a greater than symbol, but I think it's supposed to be an insertion. Um, you have an increase in histone H3 and H4 because you have expression from that locus. Um, and you get basically, I think they show similar effects. Uh, take a look here. Uh, but basically what you're seeing here is you have these kind of punctate foci of, of, um, of, nu of basically nuclear DNA. And this get, tends to be more spread out. Um, so kind of the distribution changes, which is kind of more perinuclear. Um, and that is their, that is, that is their assessment. Um, which is basically they just take uh you can see that right and so on on the this side here this is a 10 day mice 40 40 day mice you can see this effect where you have these little punctate um, foci then they get spread out through the nucleus um and with rapamycin um so the dappy intensity ratio is center over outer right so that that ratio is going to skew towards you know small ratio because you get more outer less inner right so and then that's basically a quantification of this, right? Um, and you get a similar effect, I believe, with um, overexpression of H3H4. RU486 in this case, is it overexpressing H3H4? It's not overexpressing the RNAi that knocks this down. Um, it is overexpressing H3H4. Um, and let's see what happens. So you get the same thing where you, no rapamycin um, and then RU486, um, with no rapamycin, you get a similar effect. Rapamycin, you get a similar effect. And you don't get an added effect with rapamycin and RU486, right? So that's, you get basically, you, you don't get any more, um, more change in the kind of distribution. Um, and they look here at now a different protein, HP1, which is associated with, it's, I think it's basically stands for, you know, uh, it's got it's got an appropriate name. It's got a it's got a sober name. Header I think heterochromatin protein one, right? The blue cheese or some red cheese one or something like that. But it's it's got a you know it's got a legit name. So HP one, um, and that is is associated with heterochromatin. And uh, when you overexpress your H three H four, you get a basically an increased amount of HP one expansion. Um, in both rapamycin treated and also your um, overexpressed uh, overexpressed uh, H3H4 um, histone proteins. Let's see, we got a chat here. Oops. Do we have a chat? Sometimes we get a ping and then and... just shop talk. Oliver, just oh, shop just talk. talk. Okay. Jesus yeah, I don't know if I'm was to... um, just saying uh, he was going to leave, so. Um... And presumably, um, it is Jesus. Um, he he's just joined us for the first time, and he oh, hey, saying welcome. goodbye. Oh well, um, hello and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> hello, guys. Hello, nice to meet you. Could you hear me? But, uh, yeah, we can hear you. Um, but yeah, that, um, as I say in the chat, don't worry. Uh, we do record these. Um, you'll be able to watch this on Facebook straight away. And we'll we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel as well. So if you did nice. miss the start or the end, or we we can always uh, we can always help you there. So thank, thank you. you, Steve. Thank you for sharing right. this. I am I'm just reading about this topic. It's really interesting and exciting. So I'm just landing in the biologic uh, topic. So thank you for sharing. I uh, will connect on the next meeting because I'm really interested on this. Same here. Actually, we're all just reading about this topic too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I am also learning. I, I speak Spanish and I a bit English, so I'm trying to get all the the information also from the meeting. So yeah, I, I hope in the next meeting I can get all the points. Well, thank you for toughing it out. Um, I know my sometimes I, I I tend to garble things words and and. Then... <laughs> Uh, you don't do that, Oliver. No, I've okay. never known you to ramble. Oh, God. Never. Jeez. This is yes, big. guys. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing. It's <laughs> amazing. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. See you next. Hello and farewell. That's my medical. That's going to be my medic business <laughs> meeting everybody from now on. Hello, hello. Why do you say goodbye when I say hello? 
greetings and farewell. Um, it's, uh, yeah, okay. Um, a lot of languages have that, right? A word that basically means, I think in, in Slavic languages, Czech ahoy means it's, you could say hello, it's hello and goodbye, right? So it's a universal. Um... Okay. You can't go far wrong with Spanish. You just go hola. Yeah. Even I speak a little Spanish. Uh, I'm better at French. I'm learning Russian and I speak a little Spanish, but not a lot. Okay. I gotta I wanna brush up on my check. Um my family is from um two parts. My mom's from Poland, my dad is from the former Czechoslovakia. Uh, primarily speak Slovak, but I, I, I would like to brush up on my, my Czech. Um, yeah, and your name means little bear. Means little bear. I mean, it's exactly means little bear. Um it's 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 funny because no no Slavic speaker would ever not know how to spell my name because that's what it means. And but you know, English speakers have hell of a trouble, you know, figuring out like they're always adding in let they're adding in letters all the time. And I'm like, no, it's just phonetic, man. It's just you know, it's like consonant vowel, consonant vowel. That's it. You don't have to add in extra C's or L's or V's or just geez. Um, but but yeah, but it it doesn't mean anything in an English language. So people people don't know, you know. But if, uh, if I said little bear, right, then people would know how to spell it. Right? But, but maybe I should change it to that. It sounds very Native American, little bear. That's cool. All right, little bear, okay. on with the show. Yes. <laughs> like you said, I don't ramble. Um, anyway. Never rambles. Um, okay, so that was figure three. So that's um, higher order packing and how it looks like. Uh, and then there's figure four. So increased histone expression in adult enterocytes mediates lifespan extension. Ooh, that's what we're all interested in. And intestinal homeostasis, homeostasis from rapamycin treatment, right? So, um, so I'm just going to just uh, mention here that they look at something called intestinal dysplasia, and they show these little figures here, and they show that rapamycin treatment... Um, and also over, and if you, and it's blocked by, by having your RNA I for histone H3 and H, oh, well, if you have R, knock down histone H3, then your rapamycin is not affecting intestinal, um, not improving intestinal dysplasia. Um, I don't know what this means. Um, I'm not an insect anatomist. It is length of dysplasia, percent length of, and these are dissected Drosophila colons and I don't know for the life of me what is exactly what a healthy Drosophila intestine is supposed to look like. Um, so I can just go by the bar graph and say that the dysplasia um, is improved, the length dysplasia. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this is supposed to represent, I'm assuming this represents an intestine under a microscopic slide, you know, um, with the with the with the periphery outlined in the dotted lines, um, and probably staining of cells. And I'm not sure if uh, if this means that it gets distended, the dysplasia per a given length. I mean, it certainly looks like that. Um, but I'm uh, if somebody if somebody here is a you know, the, uh, an anatomist focusing on intestines, um, you can kind of tell me exactly what that, what, what's happening there when it comes to dysplasia. Um, but dysplasia is improved. So, you know, and, uh, and that, and, and we'll, we'll see in a future figure that that's connected to um, increased expression or targeting of a protein that improves um, uh, um, cell cell adhesion, right? So basically intracellular adhesion, so it prevents basically um, intestinal leakage. So I think intestinal dysplasia is, is related to that. Um, but, um, I couldn't figure out what the little arrows were pointing to, so I'll just admit that. Um, okay, so uh, lifespan effects. So rapamycin, so here's a little grid that you can deconstruct. So basically they're showing um, rapamycin black line, you get an increase in lifespan. You can see here rapamycin black line increase in lifespan. 
if you have RNAi for H3 or H4, um, that abrogates the rapamycin effect, right? So you don't get the lifespan extension. And it doesn't make them live shorter. It just doesn't, it blocks rapamycin effects. So that's important. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make them sicker. It doesn't cripple them in any way. It just basically knocking down H3 and H4 just blocks that additional effect from rapamycin. Um, and if we look at this figure all the way on C, um, if we upregulate H3 and H4, um, you can see, so the upregulation is uh, through the use of RU486, just like here, but in this case, it's a beneficial effect because it's giving more histones, more H3 and H4. You can see you get a lifespan extension um, similar to, but not more than the rapamycin effect. Um, so if you have rapamycin and RU486, which is um, blue line, it's there. If you have just rapamycin, no RU486, it's the black line. And what do we have here? And if it's just RU486, um, well, you get maybe a little, I don't know, that's statistically slightly less, but you do get an increase compared to the black dash line from RU486, which is an increase of H3H4. I'm not exactly sure. It could be that there's maybe some additional things that rapamycin is doing, uh, not just boosting H3H4. Um, it could be improving those other DNA repair pathways that we alluded to before, that might not just be H3 and H4, um, but okay, but you do get a blockage if you if you inhibit um, H3 and H4, so that's a big, big effect. Okay, so um, what do they look at here? So they look at, um, so this I'm not, I'm not entirely familiar with, they look at these intestinal stem cell proliferation, and I'm not entirely sure what the correlation is with um, kind of a worse situation for the gut. Um, because here you have, so the, the cells that are the most active are your enterocytes, which are your differentiated cells. Here you have ice, SC proliferation goes up, which is they're measuring it through this marker that labels these cells called pH3. That might mean that you have less enterocytes entering division because you have more ISC proliferation taking place. Um, so what they do here is they show that without rapamycin RE486, this is the amount of your pH3 plus cells in your gut in a certain, I guess, area. Uh, this goes up with RE486, so you have more, if, uh, so these cells go up when you knock down H3. Um, and they go down if you basically um, add rapamycin, but then they go back up again if you, again, knock down H3 with RE486. Uh, so they basically show that there's this, this correlation between, between ISC proliferation, which i um, not entirely 100% sure how that's linked to e, uh, ES cells. I, you know, I think, I mean, this suggests to me that there's an inverse relationship, more ISC proliferation, less enterocytes, but um, it might be carried somewhere in the paper. Um, and you get an improvement in, again, uh, improvement in something called intestinal dysplasia. So the gut health is, is improved. Um, so let's go down to figure five. So I'm going to stop sharing here. All right. Any, any questions? So we're getting a figure five. We have three more figures. The last figure is basically a recapitulation of the entire paper in mice. So figure eight, if you follow through thus far, figure eight should be easy. So in, in figure four, they show all these disparate effects that they consider positive with rapamycin and they, yeah. they test their H3, H4 hypothesis. And um, like, I, I know they go into talking about autophagy later as like, maybe this is one of the things that's mediating the effect of rapamycin, but um, they, they sort of zoom past this in figure three in their panel A and B when they're looking at the chromatin rearrangement they show that when they um, add rapamycin or when they like overexpress H3, H4, they get these, this perinuclear um, localization of their, of, their, of their DNA signals measured by DAPI. Um, to me, that's really, really cool because it implies something. Um, at least in Drosophila, when you have that pattern of DNA localization, um, mm -hmm. that's consistent with DNA repair and heterochromatin. Like um, there's, there's been a lot of like pretty cool 
imaging papers where they'll do things like directly introduce UV lesions into Drosophila DNA and then watch mm -hmm. the DNA move and it goes mm -hmm. to the periphery. And you can also get like histone incorporation at the periphery. So um, their panel B is kind of mind boggling to me because the implication is that, all right, we're gonna upregulate H3, H4 and that in and of itself is going to like start inducing DNA repair. Um, maybe, I mean, they don't yeah. test that in this paper but it's yeah. consistent and it's a really enticing hypothesis because if you're doing that, if you're actually like inducing DNA repair you could do a thousand other things downstream of that. Like that could explain yeah. your altered stem cells, your altered like dysplasia mm -hmm. and God knows what else. Um, and you also see this effect here. I mean, it's kind of modest, but it might be real, right? Like even without rapamycin, you see the, you see the, the distribution changes from 10 day to 40 day, right? Right here, right. here. Um, you know, much more pronounced with rapamycin, but, but you still see that, that, that correlation here, right? Which is consistent with their figure one, where they also show like that age dependent effect. Uh, one moment here. Um, Steve, can you hold the fort for one minute? I have to just pause. I have to get the door. Somebody is not on the bathroom door, but my outside door. <laughs> uh, I'm going to just uh, let somebody in and I will be right back. I just uh, Let's hope it's not an axe murderer or something like that, you know? Yeah, if you hear a blood curdling scream, um, which you want. It's okay, folks. He was uh, he was in the Marines. I'm sure he can handle it. So, uh, hmm. Do hope he's going to be all right. Yeah, it's worth noting about um, gut structure, microbiome. Yes, I'm talking about the microbiome again. It's um, there's a paper that came out this month. Um, that I need to delve into that's suggesting that microbiome health and the gene expressions that it actually regulates uh, are a very strong determinant of longevity. So I might suggest we cover that in the next journal club because uh, they were saying like 70% of the gene expressions associated with longevity were to do with the microbiome. So again, that's possibly something else to consider here is that rapamycin in improving the microbiome and obviously helping support the beneficial uh, bacteria could also be um, contributing to longevity in that way as well. So uh, yeah, just, just going to run that one up your flagpoles and uh, see what you think of that. But You, you honestly, dropped some knowledge and I, I missed it. Uh, I'm always dropping uh, the old knowledge bombs. But yeah, I was just saying that there's a new paper out and I think we might want to look at that next time where they did a study and they looked at the uh, the microbiome and its contribution to longevity and about 70% of the, uh, should we say, longevity associated genes are actually regulated to a, a lesser or greater extent by microbiome. So it's becoming increasingly apparent that the health of your microbiome is very, very important for uh, for longevity. And I mean, I could pull loads of papers out that to support that, you know, like cent uh, centenarians, their gut microbiomes generally resemble people who are considerably younger. So I'm just going to put it out there. We're more than just their cells. And it's incredibly important, the microbiome. Mike Lusgarden is going to be uh, probably watching this going because he loves the microbiome. But uh, yeah, honestly, I think he's probably right when he suggests that the microbiome might even be a candidate for um, another hallmark of aging. Um, it is that fundamental? But, you know, we can uh, we can talk about that next time if you want to do that paper. Just, wouldn't, just it be funny, see, uh, wouldn't it be funny if in the end we find out that what's regulating the microbiome and anything else all along has been midichlorians? Well, I don't know. I mean, George Lucas was right. Well, I mean, you know, obviously, Medichlorians is a, is supposedly based on the idea of mitochondria. What are mitochondria? Yeah. Yeah. Mitochondria are bacteria, which obviously long ago, well, there's a very good chance that very long ago they're bacteria that actually invaded our cells. Although some people still argue and say that they're not. Personally, I I honestly think mitochondria are probably stowaways 
and the fact that they've got their own DNA is pretty telling. So, yeah. So, yeah, microbiome. Yeah, um, of course. You know, people forget that we're probably actually more microbial than we are our own cells. Oh, we are. Which, yeah. is, which, is, which is absolutely mind-boggling. And we know that the ratios of different types of bacteria in the gut tend to change in, uh, in detrimental ways as we get older. And in fact, there are actually some biomarkers that are, you know, that are quite reliable that are based on taking samples of the microbiome. But, but there we go. I'm just going to put that one out there that I think that rapamycin in helping to stabilize the microbiome may also be contributing to longevity in that way as well. So, and, and, and just to add a little, little bit more complexity to this um, before we get back into the paper, speaking of the microbiome, you know, um, it's not just the microbiome ourselves, but we live in an environment. So we're basically, we're, we're sort of a, you know, it's sort of a gradient of like of, living fuzz, right, that we're all basically connected to. I mean, where did rapamycin get discovered in? A soil bacteria, right? So people live in an environment where this, where you're picking this stuff up and it might be having, having an effect on your body if you live in a certain environmental, you know, in certain in environment, right? Depending on what, what sort of microbes are, are in that environment, right? And certainly your microbiome changes if you basically travel and go to some other places. So um, it can get rapidly complicated really fast. Oh, yes. Okay. So let's go back to something slightly less complicated. Um, let's go back to uh, go back to the paper here. Um, so we were speaking about heterochromatin. We did figure four. Um, so uh, increased histone expression in enterocytes, mediated slightly defense extension. And now we're in figure five. And I have to admit, there's some parts of figure five that I found a little bit confusing, um, kind of depending on what was in the figure and what was in the text. So maybe people can clear that up for me. So figure five has a bunch of things. Um, increased histone expression in enterocytes from rapamycin treatment. Um, it's autophagy by altered histone marks and maintains gut barrier functions. And that's what I alluded to before. So maybe we'll start with E and F. It seems like I'm jumping the gun, but you know, um, it's a connection to figure four, which is they showed better, less, you know, improved uh, gut function through this dysplasia model. Um, and here they show that if you increase um, histone H3 and H4 or add rapamycin, um, you know, histone H3, H4 going up by adding in the RU486, um, you get an expression of this protein. I think it's called Coralin. Um, not 100% sure. Um, I think... Uh, it's a, uh, it was one of those proteins that basically mediates intracellular junctions, right? So basically prevent, connects your cells and prevents things from leaking. And that, that white line here, it's basically immunohistochemistry that's showing that you have more of this protein at these junctions within the enterocytes. And that goes up uh, when you basically give um, RU486 by boosting h 3 h 4 um, or rapamycin, and it doesn't go up any further if you have both, right? So increase, and they do this kind of neat little test to show that the, these junctions are actually functional um, by injecting a blue dye. Um, I forget what the dye was. It's a common blue dye, right? What's it, um, it's just brilliant blue FCF. It's like literally yeah. the supermarket food coloring. <laughs> ah, yeah. So, so yeah. I guess if you drink a lot of that, you you too will turn into a Smurf. So they call the the flies non-Smurf Smurf, um, because this dye will leak out of their guts. So I guess they put it in their water and they drink it, and then they turn blue. Mm -hmm. And if they don't turn blue, it's because, well, they're the gut. The you know it's uh, you know the barriers are pretty intact, right? So basically. Um, proportion Smurf, right? So this is your normal basal Smurf levels, and you basically have more of these junctions because your, you know, intestinal integrity goes up. Um, RU486. Um, so it looks like again, rapamycin, you get much better, um, and you do get, you know, uh, good with RU486. So increase H3H4. So rapamycin could be doing additional effects to boost, um, you know, that, you know, um, uh, boost gut. Um, uh, ability of guts to be less permeable, basically, by having injections. But anyway, so um, that's one, one downstream effect. 
So that's in figure five. So we're going to scroll back here to the autophagy stuff. They, they do gene expression analysis. Um, they do, I think they look at a lot of things, but they then zoom in on these proteins here. Uh, BCHS, which is blue cheese, which is basically your protein that is a cargo adapter protein that targets things to the autophagosome and two other proteins, one that doesn't get regulated in response called STAT92E and then DOR. Um, don't exactly know, uh, what is it? DOR is, what does DOR stand for? I forgot what the DOR stand, stood for. Um, and it has some effect, uh, some, uh, I can't, I don't know its exact placement to DOR and STAT92. They pulled it out of another screen, um, you know, what, uh, what role they play in autophagy. But the one that is, I definitely know is the BCHS. Um, and they show that if you increase your, you know, H3, H4 expression, your BCHS, which is kind of downstream, downstream, like really at the level of autophagy where, you know, autophagosomes are, are you know, your, your cargo is actually being targeted directly. Uh, the full change goes up um, in response to, so yellow is uh, increased H3, H4 when you boost the levels using your RU486 treatment. Your red is just uh, rapamycin and the green is both. So I don't think this is a significantly more. Um, interestingly, so there's no effect on the STAT92E protein, but they mentioned the DOR protein. And here it looks like, well, it looks like they go down, but if I'm not mistaken in the paper, that's they say it goes up. And I'm like, hmm, uh, where's figure five? Figure five in the paper. Um, Let's see, let's see, figure 5A, where is that mentioned here? Uh, well, anyway, um, it's in there somewhere. Um, so let me go back up to, uh, so let me go back up to the figure. So if you have your figure there, maybe you could you could find that and try to explain that to me. Um, but this correlates to basically also um, altered um, methylation status at several different histones um, that regulate the expression of these proteins, particularly BCHS, right? So those levels go up, um, the methylation status, which regulates the trans, which basically is related to the transcriptional status of these, of these uh, factors. Um, can't recall off the top of my head where DOR, DOR is, my apologies, in this pathway, but ECHS is uh, the one that they focus on later. Um, and this is the one that they can look at as a, as a protein with an analog in, in uh, mice that has a um, has another name, an acronym starting with a W. But blue cheese goes up um, and the, the, the histone status that basically is related to um, uh, to its expression levels uh, goes up as well. Um, and that is uh, inversely related to the heterochromatin status. So it's being expressed So the heterochromatin status. These lo loci should go down, so BCHS goes down. So you should have greater expression, right? So this is their tie-in, first tie-in to autophagy here. Um, and then the second tie-in is figure C and D, where they look at factors that basically promote autophagy. Um, and I just want to go in. Um, so this gets a little bit confusing. There's like another confusing click here. But there's the, this ATG8A1 and A2, which is an active form of one of the proteins that's uh, responsible for autophagy. And then there's REF2P, which, um, where is it? Here we go. ATG8, uh, A2, and REF2P, um, so Drosophila, P62 homolog, so ATG8-2, the active form of ATG8-A is a marker of autophagy, reflecting number of autophagosomes, and REF2P is a cargo receptor for ubiquitinated proteins destined for degradation. So, um, so there's kind of a, a little bit of a weird kind of inverse effect here that they explain in the paper. Um, so if you have higher turnover, this level actually goes down, I believe. So, um, so when they look at, uh, so when they look at total, um, 
REF2 protein levels in response to RU486 or rapamycin or both, they go down. And they mentioned there that this is because you have a higher turnover. So, um, so I guess if you're, if things are going to the cargo, they're getting more broken down. You know, you'd ex I would expect them to go up, but they go down here. And they explained that in the paper that this is indicative of greater uh, lysosomal turnover as a result. Yeah, the, the ATG8 is, um, it, so to my understanding, they're homologs of LC3. And um, I don't know a lot about autophagy, but like allegedly LC3 two to one ratio is like the best way to quantify, maybe the only way to quantify like levels of autophagy in cells. Mm. So, um, so this is that in it with two total proteins. So ATG2 to total proteins uh, goes down and also to the active form ATG2 8A2 to ATG 8A1 goes down as a result. Um, also, REF2 goes down. Um, and also, when they look at your, so they look at uh, Lysotracker, which is basically, um, you know, things that are in uh, lysosomes. Um, Cyto ID, which I believe it's for um, autophagosomes. Um, let's see, where's the double check that that's, that's the marker for it. Um, Co-staining lysotracker fluorescent dye labeling acidic organelles, including autolysosomes and cyto-D fluorescent dye labeling autophagosomes. Okay. So those are two, you know, um, two cellular markers here. So um, if you have lysotracker with RU486 and rapamycin, um, your auto uh, lysosome levels go up but your cyto ID, they go down. So I don't know if that, again, they mentioned that that's because they're actually, more of them are fusing and basically being degraded. So as a result, so that's why the levels go down is that they end up here um, fused. So I think, I think that's, the, that's the interpretation. So basically the bottom line is that you have more, um, more, uh, well, more autophagic activity uh, as a result. Um, one thing that just wasn't clear here is that they mentioned cyto ID stain puncti, and, and this figure here seems to show that there's very little change, but I'm looking at the cyto ID here and I could see that, well, I mean, clearly this is different from all of these. Um, and I'm, 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 you would think that that's because these are being fused with those autophagosomes or, or, or basically lysosomes. So you have, you know, you have degradation of your, of your autophagosome contents as a result, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure if I'm actually looking at this correctly here, why these levels look like they have not really changed when I'm looking at the figure here and it looks like they have. I, I feel like they might be a victim of a bad y-axis because it scaled to 1500 and uh, um, does not go anywhere near there under yeah. their conditions. Yeah. So perhaps, perhaps, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the, because you do see that it goes, looks like it goes, well, I don't know. I don't want to. It's kind of hard to see much of anything, right? Like it's kind of all squished down there. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, but they, yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, um, that was, so that was, that was kind of one issue that was just nagging me. I was looking at this. I'm like, oh, this, I don't know. This, this, this looks way different than these three. I, and I'm like looking at the, the kind of the plot interpretation here. I'm like, hmm, um, am I reading that right? Because I would assume that it would make sense that you would actually have less of them here considerably because they're fusing with your, uh, with your lysosomes. Then you get your auto bigo lysosome and contents are being degraded. Which, which is the um, argument that's being made in the paper. But, um, but that this here, I'm just not seeing it reflected on this. On this. Anyway, um, I'm not gonna batter that anymore, just mentioning that. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, could be, it's probably in, could be a very straightforward answer here, but I just, uh, could be just a scale issue. But anyway, so let's go to figure six. I think that was the, the, no, this is the figure two. Well, no, actually figure five is sort of the one. So figure six, autophagy activation is necessary for mTORC1 histone axis on survival. 
and intestinal homeostasis. Um, so what are we looking at here? Um, so uh, ATG5, um, so ATG5 is, is required for, let's see, what, uh, I know it's part of the, it's part required for the regulation of autophagy. I, it's back in the figure here. I don't know if they have the, oops, uh, okay. ATG5, well, that's probably part somewhere in that complex. I'm getting an ATG5 pointed up there somewhere. ATG5 is required for um, autophagy. Um, and they want to show that you know that this is that that this is downstream of histone H3 H4 expression. Um, apologies for the rumble you're hearing right now. There's work taking place in the building, so it's not an earthquake. So I say. Um, so uh, so yeah. So we've got DAPI staining here, nuclei, lyso tracker. Um, so overexpression of histone H3 H4. You are you 486? You got more of this targeting of you have more autophagy taking place. You have more things being targeted to uh, lysosomes. Um, but if you knock down, if you overexpress H3H4 and you overexpress in RE486 and you knock down ATG5, which is part of the autophagosome complex, you don't get any more, I guess, targeting. You get no less autophagy. So you, you don't have um, you don't have these auto. Lysosomes building up. Um, so, so this is sort of one of their main connections here. That this is, you know, happening, um, happening downstream of H3H4, and it requires um, at least this one component, um, ATG5. Let's see if they mentioned this in the paper here specifically. Where in the um, could have been earlier in the paper where they unpack ATG5 a little bit more. What was its exact role in the autophagus? Anyway, um, it's in the complex. Um, so this also affects lifespan. So if you basically have RU46 induction of H3H4, you have an extension of lifespan, this dark bulk line. If you knock down, um, if you don't have induction, you normal. Um, if you do have induction, but you basically knock down um, ATG5, um, using RNAi, uh, using RNAi port. I don't know if that's probably the same locus, so it's basically dual regulation. Um, so if you still have higher histone levels, but you basically knock down the, you know, phagus auto phagocytic uh, activity, um, then you abrogate the lifespan extension. So that is it's probably one of their kind of important figures here at this point. Um, to show linking lifespan extension to autophagy to um, upregulated histone H3H4 expression, which is downstream of your, evidently of your, you know, mTOR signaling pathway. Um, and they show that this ATG5 effect, um, this autophagy effect is also um, uh, important for intestinal dysplasia and intestinal integrity. Basically, it you know, you have more of these Smurf flies as a result by knocking down ATG5 activity, even though you increase H3H4. So you have, you know, intestinal dysplasia is is increased um, if uh, if even if you increase your histone H3H4s, but you basically block autophagy by knocking down ATG5. Um, so that's that's kind of the key takeaway of this figure. Um, any questions here before I stop sharing? I'm going to just we'll pause here. So that is, it is what it is. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, scroll, scroll, scroll. Are we on? Figure seven. Okay. So now they get further downstream. So this is BCHS blue cheese, which is required for you can't stop Drosophila genes, 18 wheeler hedgehog, son of hedgehog. Um anyway, um 
BCA blue cheese is required target for autophagy activation, lifespan extension, and intestinal homeostasis from the mTORC1 histone axis. So again, this is in the, this is basically what, um, this is a, your, your cargo protein, which basically is a, a cargo adapter protein. So cargo is things that get packed into vesicles. Your adapter protein is which, what binds to the cargo. And the cargo in this case being, you know, um, misformed proteins or anything else that basically is targeted for lytic activity, right? So your BCHS is mediating that. Um, so they want to show that all of these effects are also blocked by blocking BCHS, right? So, you know, basically recapitulating what we saw up there, um, increase H3H4 activity through RU486, knock down BCHS with RNAi, you basically, you know, get, um, you get less of this um, lytic vesicles, evidently less things being targeted to these vesicles that bind to this adaptive protein BCHS. Um, again, this is just a graph that modifies what you see on the, on the left. And then you get this blockage of lifespan extension um, if, you, uh, if you express the BCHS RNAi. Um, again, your intestinal dysplasia effects, your intestinal integrity, um, that's all basically blocked um, by inhibiting BCHS. Um, and uh, what else do we hear? Oh, and you can get an increase in lifespan by just basically um, increasing BCHS levels themselves. Right? So basically putting in, you know, everything downstream of that. So putting in more proteins into your autophagolysosomes via your BCHS adapter protein, if you have more of it <clears throat> through boosted activity by adding in your RU486, then you have more lifespan, right? So um, again, so that's, that basically finishes our Drosophila section of the pathway that they've been kind of teasing out here. And they now go and recapitulate this in mice right? So mammals um, to an extent, right? So <clears throat> I don't think uh, you can go through all of the supplementals. So there's probably other, um, other data in there. They just look at some of it. Um, so they look at mice 12 months, mid-age, 22 months old. We also look at the intestines of mice. Um, and they show that, you know, that uh, you have, uh, what do we show here? That you have higher levels, even though the levels so in this case, what is it? The levels of, uh, so rapamycin does increase, you know, your, your levels of your um, histone proteins, but unlike mice, they normally go slightly down, right? So then we just see in Drosophila them going up slightly, going down here in mice slightly, right? So um, I don't know if that's significant going from here to here, because you got these error bars um, certainly does, does seem when you have the rapamycin, but they are higher. So the rapamycin is increasing the levels of, um, you know, probably can't get too much one-to-one um, -one between uh, Drosophila and mice, but um, so that's kind of interesting that they would go up in, in Drosophila, but either stay static or go slightly down in mice, but they do go up in, in response to rapamycin, right? So you do have those levels. And your chromatin organization also changes. So they look at this DAPI intensity center to outer. Um, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, it's slighter, but significant with rapamycin treatment, um, but not as significant with old and young, which again, I think it was, you noticed it much more with the Drosophila. So that kind of makes sense when we look at, you know, the background of the old and young mice here. Um, but rapamycin is having an effect, um, definitely. Um, and the nucleosome occupancy levels change. So this is an assay using uh, an enzyme called microcockle nuclease, which basically chops up DNA between nucleosomes, and you basically can see how they're, you know, how they're packed. So more of these, uh, more of these uh, bands suggest that you have more nucleosomes, more histones, so that that level goes up with more rapamycin. Um, and then E is. Uh, gene expression levels that they showed using control, which is either static or goes down. And this protein called um, WDFY3, I don't know if you can pronounce that, like 
blue cheese. It's probably just WTA all three. And I think that's basically, um, I think that is the analog or homolog to, um, to uh, blue cheese, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, Gene Card says they're the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so they so 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 that is that's what they have. Um, they might have more data in the you know um, somewhere buried in the supplementals, um, but that is the data that they present for the mice, um, and this is the model that they that they then um, illustrate. I think you know definitely um, there's a lot of work that went into this, and it's a great I think bridge uh, between you know between what we see as kind of disparate drivers of aging and, and things that basic and longevity pathways that can affect aging. But now you're, you're linking, you know, the TOR pathway, um, which, you know, always has been a nexus of regulation, but, you know, but here it's now, you know, bridging longevity pathways, um, you know, uh, themselves, um, and particularly, um, you know, bridging, um, you know, connecting autophagy you know, with the TOR pathway itself, with nutrient sensing and signaling, but also it's having effect here on chromatin stability um, and chromatin organization, um, which which may have an effect. Well, certainly at the low side, they looked at for BCH in Drosophila, it affected the methylation status, but it might have other effects, um, you know, with this kind of gross nuclear reorganization in response to rapamycin. No doubt would have other methylation effects, so um, and other other um, uh, other epigenetic effects that are correlated with you know enhanced longevity. So um, I like this paper a lot because you know it it answered a lot of questions and made a lot of great connections, but also raises a lot of questions that can be filled in you know with further experimentation. And some of the questions that um, you know Michael pointed out earlier and then and I added on to and then we all kind of you know suggested you know there it might not just be an histone H3 H4 effect there might be additional effects from this on other um, DNA repair pathways as well and then tie into the the torus and torus going pathway itself right that uh, so um, so yeah so that is the summary of the paper so um, you know, again, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big step forward um, for, you know, for uh, longevity research, moving away from using aging research, longevity research, um, uh, because it, you know, it fills in a lot of gaps in our knowledge and especially, you know, elucidates some of the mechanisms for, for a molecule that's, you know, being used for other treatments, um, rapamycin, uh, and, and kind of, sheds light on how, how, you know, this might have a beneficial effect at certain dosages and kind of a paradoxical effect. So, um, you know, with, with higher dosages. So, um, so I think, you know, we should look into, you know, definitely keep an eye, eye open on other drugs that might have kind of similar effects, not discount things immediately just because we think it has supposedly an opposite effect when dosages count. And now we know a little bit more about how the pathways operate, at least in mice and fruit flies, right? So next up, human cells, right? Repeat all of this in human tissue culture, low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, you could, we could sit down and we could write a grant application right now. It's, it'll just take time, won't be, won't be too hard. I mean, just basically copy pasta, all of the hard work these scientists did here, and just apply it to another model organism, humans, and uh, and see see how much see how much overlay we get. I mean, tissue culture is always a high bar, um, but for what it's worth, if you want to like make human tissue, if you if you want to study, wow, well, like enterocytes, organoids, organoids. So we can actually make decent intestinal organoid organoids mm -hmm. these days, um, and even if that wasn't true, you can still. We get biopsies <laughs> um, from that sort of tissue. So if you wanted to just validate simple hypotheses, like is there an age associated difference in H3H4 or a rapamycin induced change in H3H4, you could test that. Yep. You could totally test that, it would not be hard. Um, yep. And I, I don't say that lightly because quite often if you want to do the cool tissue experiment in humans, it's you just can't. Um, but um, intestine, the story is a little bit different. I gotta check. I know we have we have some organoids in uh, 
intestinal organoids in the, in the chamber. But I don't know if they're human or mouse, so I've got to ask. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, definitely. So there's, there's so so uh, we could we could sit here and discuss for the next several hours all the potential experiments that this paper suggests. So that's that's an example of a good paper that you have you have you have some really intriguing data. You know, plugs in a lot of gray gaps here, but then you know, but then suggests a lot of other experiments that basically um, you know kind of leads the way um, for 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 other experiments to be done. Um, and this is how 90% of science works for most people out there listening is that you basically, you know, you, you do what we did right now. You, you, you read the papers and then, you know, the data suggests additional experiments. And then you sort of, like an octopus, creep outwards to, you know, other, other model organisms, right? And um, with, if you, obviously, if you're interested in medicine, it's going to, you know, end up in humans. Um, Organ, you know, human organoids, tissue culture, eventually clinical trials, right, as well. So, so that's that's kind of how it progresses. Um, then you've got the small percentage of aha moments, which are, you know, you leap over everything and then you put together data that nobody's, you know, envisioned before, and then you have this sort of breakthrough, right? But that's kind of that that happens rarely, right? And then you have another nexus of knowledge somewhere else. Ninety percent of the time, it's like this: you read the paper and and it suggests additional experiments and you basically keep putting pieces of the puzzle in until you, you have a picture that makes sense. Then you test it. So, um, so great job to everybody who um, actually worked on this paper. It wasn't me. Um, I just basically <laughs> read extracts from it and presented it to all of you. And thanks everybody for, for joining me on this. So that's all I got, Steve. So, oh, and another reminder, if you just joined us, we have a um, conference at the end of August. Uh, One more. Conference? Conference. Tell me more. Tell you more. Um, we have um, researchers. <laughs> so bad. We have researchers from many disciplines throughout aging and longevity. Um, we have got other conferences that we've, you know, if you'd like to take a peek at what, what we've, what we've had before, certainly go visit lifespan.io, but get your tickets because the clock's running out, um, 11 o'clock, the, you know, it's going to be 50 bucks more. So 11 PM Eastern time, get your tickets. The conference is August 19th through 22nd, right? So it's, is it, or is it, yeah, 19th through 22nd. Well, I hope you'd know, Oliver, seeing as you're one of the MCs. Well, that's, uh, a bit worrying that's... that you don't. So we'll talk more after we finish yeah. this stream. Well, August 19th, mm. is, it's not tomorrow, is it? We're still in June, technically. It June? worries me that you don't know what you're doing. Um, mm. But yes, anyway, we we don't worry, folks. Oliver will be there. We'll, we'll be yeah. definitely reminding him um, that he's got to host the conference again. So yep. it's our uh, it's our fourth one, isn't it? It's our fourth one. It's a fourth one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a, so so we're actually 50 50 now on virtual versus physical conferences. Yeah. Thanks, COVID. Um, but as last year did prove, uh, I actually thought last year's conference was just as good, yeah. if not better. And I and I know people are going to go, <gasps> but I'm going to say that why I thought it was better is because the virtual aspect allowed everybody like wherever in the world you are to join us, which was cool rather than just restricting it just to people who were able to make it to New York. I mean, let's face it, going to conferences, even as a journalist is very expensive. So I don't go to very many of them because we're very poor and we're a charity. We're a 501. We can't afford it. Um, all my clothes are threadbare. It's just terrible. Um, so on that note, if you would like to support quality journalism, as well as the conference, obviously, uh, Oliver's mentioned, um, and you'd like to support streams like this and all the, well, all the wonderful things that the team are doing, the news outlet, the, uh, oh, all sorts, Oliver, we do so many things, streams like this, events, all sorts of things, uh, educational things, if you'd like to support us, like uh, quite a lot of people already are maybe consider becoming a lifespan hero and uh, supporting us every month with a, a little bit, a bit of donation. Every little helps. And you can also, as a bonus, 
join us on these calls, which are absolutely riveting, honestly. Mm. Now, we, we do have a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah. So if you want to learn about how to be a lifespan hero, uh, check us out at lifespan.io forward slash heroes and uh, give that a thought. But yeah, it's uh, it's 11 o'clock tonight, Eastern. Um, if you want to go to the conference, we've got loads of stuff uh, lined up. We're still announcing speakers. We've got Eric Verdin from um, the Book Institute. We've got obviously... Aubrey de Grey, who's, well, you know, probably needs no introduction, but is awesome. He's going to be there. We, uh, we've we just had uh, confirmation that Calico, uh, Google Calico uh, will be speaking. Uh, uh, Dr. Kimmel, or Kimmel, Kimmel. Um, he will be uh, speaking at the event as well. So I'm super excited about that because Google, Google's been really, really secretive. And everyone's like, what's going on with Google? And then all of a sudden, recently oliver they just dropped a new way of doing um yamanaka factors except much safer we really should do a, a journal club about that about how we'll do that using... next yeah perhaps it'll be in the next month maybe but then maybe. there's that the microbiome thing but yeah um... google super exciting because they found a safer way of activating the Amanaka factors. I know the, 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 the classic OSKM, um, it works, it can be made to work, but there are apparently subtypes of these factors that appear to also induce partial cellular reprogramming and are a lower risk of um, uh, uh, causing cancers and whatnot. So I'm just gonna suggest that that might be a paper that we might wanna do next time. If you want to talk about reprogramming, not that aging's program, guys, not that aging is programmed necessarily, but it may involve some programmed processes. Reprogramming the longevity mechanisms. Yeah, it's not that it's not that aging is programmed, but it's not that aging isn't programmed. So there you go. I'm going to be all contrarian and say it's probably both. And on that note. Oliver's going to kill me. So I will see what he really hates programmed aging stuff, uh, but I will explain. I will explain all the next time we meet in Berlin. I will reveal my, what was it you called it? The grand aging Unif theory. Grand unified theory of aging. The grand unified theory of aging. Well, I've got one. So we'll discuss that over a beer when okay. we're in Berlin next year. Fingers okay. crossed, guys. I would like to see people again. Yeah. So. Me too. But until then, we hopefully will see you at the virtual conference and um, take care, I guess, and stay safe. Yep. And, you know, hopefully this will all be over soon. The pandemic, I mean, you know, I would kind of like to get back to normal. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'd kind of like to go out a bit and, well, you know, just do stuff. So there we go. Anyway, so stay safe. We'll see you next time. Great. Right.